My name is Margie Avery and I'm Senior Acquisitions Editor at Trinity University Press. Thank you for joining us for the Maverick Book Club. The books we discuss in this monthly series explore the rich stories of Texas, but in this first season we are focused on our hometown of San Antonio. Be it a provocative look at life during World War II or a discussion about writing Black history, our series aims to be as diverse as the city itself. Tonight, David Johnson, a professor emeritus at University of Texas at San Antonio, will be discussing his book, In the Loop, A Political and Economic History of San Antonio, the culmination of years of extensive research into the development of Texas's oldest city. It is. Enjoy yourself. Ask questions in the chat for us. Um, at the end, don't forget to check out the book we'll all be reading and talking about next month. Uh, name them, they fly better. Pat Hammond's Theory of Aerodynamics. Um, so right now I'll hand it off to our friend, um, beloved San Antonio journalist, Rick Casey, who will be leading our discussion. Uh, thanks thank again for joining us. Thank you, Margie. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Trinity University uh, Press for tapping me to do this. Talking San Antonio history with David Johnson is a great uh, pleasure. Uh, a long time, highly regarded history professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio, David Johnson focused on the history of crime about which he published much, but also on the history of politics and economics of San Antonio. Now that he's been retired and unburdened of pesky students, he has produced In the Loop, a political and economic history of San Antonio. David, uh, before we get going, I, I got a call from a friend a few days ago. Without any opening pleasantries, he, he said, let me ask you a question. Do you think David Johnson's book is the best history of San Antonio ever? And I said, well, I guess so. That's, that's what I said on the cover. <laughs> he, he hadn't noticed. Uh, but, but he said he'd been up reading it until one o'clock the night before. And this is a guy who rarely gets to his office before after six o'clock in the morning. So he was, he was really gripped. Uh, it's good to know that we have a fan out there. And I believe he he told me he was going to be with us tonight. I hope he is. Uh, David, I'd like to start with a brief bit of your history. Tell me about your education and your history training. Okay. Um, I was an undergraduate at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, uh, which is where I first encountered the issue of urban history uh, in the context of the American Revolution, which has got me interested in the topic. And then I went to the University of Chicago for my doctoral work where I got distracted from the revolution, ended up working on crime and law enforcement, and also spent a lot of time studying the issue of how cities develop. Did uh, the University of Chicago at that time already have its famous motto, where fun goes to die? <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, I don't remember having a lot of fun there. Uh, <laughs> I, probably a little exaggerated. Uh, the program I was in was great. I was studying with the man who founded the field of urban history in America. Uh, and I became his research assistant and I worked a lot on rioting in the 1970s for him and worked on various kinds of things about law enforcement and ended up writing a book on the police. Uh -huh. Well, what a rich topic, uh, crime and police in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> yes, I didn't uh, lack resources. <laughs> Uh, you know, a University of Chicago doctorate is not exactly shabby. Did you come directly to San Antonio? No, I spent five years in the University of New Orleans. Uh -huh. It was my first job. And then I came in 1975, I came to UTSA as it opened for undergraduates uh, the first year, the fall of 75. So you were there from the basically from the beginning. I'm a founding faculty member officially. Uh-huh. Well, you've, you've, seen a lot of, you've seen a lot of changes both there and in the city. I, you told me the other day that this book was 40 years in the making. Tell, tell us what you meant. That was a slight exaggeration, only 38. Okay. Um, <laughs> the issue, I, I had a dual track in my research interests. Um, I had to finish my first book on policing but also being in a new city and beginning to notice some things about it that didn't fit with my undergraduate training about how cities should be growing and how they are op they operate. I just got interested as a sidetrack on San Antonio. So I worked with some people at UTSA, particularly John Booth, who is a political scientist then. Mm -hmm. And we published a book on the called the politics of San Antonio. 
So I date my interest in researching San Antonio from that particular experience. Um, in the meantime, of course, I continued my work on crime and law enforcement. So my main interest was getting work on that out. And I sort of worked on San Antonio when I had time. Uh -huh. So it was a matter of just accumulating in interest. And when I retired, I finally had a lot more time <laughs> to work on San Antonio. Well, it is a sweeping book. I thought what we would do, um, since I'm talking to a professor, uh, I think I'm supposed to tell what we're going to talk about, then we'll talk about it, and then I'll talk about what we did talk about. <laughs> I think the structure we're supposed to do. Yes. I, I thought it would be good to talk first about the, a couple of the really important themes that you discussed, things that are fundamental uh, uh, factors of uh, what you refer to as the political and economic history of San Antonio. Uh, and, and that had to, to do, the, let's start with talking about the boosters and the, the failure of, of developing a, a booster culture. First of all, I, I think it's important that you tell us what you mean by boosters, because I know the first time I heard the word, uh, I, I just thought of boosters as being uh, kind of Babbitt characters uh, who were just, you know, mindlessly cheerleaders for the city. That's not what you mean. No, it's a stereotype of boosters. Uh, the, the word itself comes out of the 19th century when there were some pretty hilarious efforts to boost places that never made it out of the category of mud hole. Um, and the term became one of derision pretty quickly. But the idea that I'm working in here is that in my graduate training, uh, I learned that based on certain models, case studies like New York City, that the business communities of cities are supposed to behave in a certain way that develops a city, makes it grow, makes it more economically diverse, all that sort of thing. So for me, boosters were people who were committed to making the city a better place to live and a better place to work. And from that, um, I, I went in with a stereotype about what boosters did, and I found out it wasn't working in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find the businessmen doing what they were supposed to do according to the theories I had learned. So from there, I began to probe the issue of why not? Why wasn't it working the way my graduate education told me it was supposed to work? So, I found fascinating your discussion from the very we're talking about the history of San Antonio as an urban place really begins uh, shortly after, do you think it's fair to say it begins shortly after the Alamo? As an urban place? Um, well, as much as it was urban, but, uh, you know. Yeah, so, well, I mean, there's a technical hang up here. The, uh, the U.S. Census still defines the city as a, a, a central place of 2,000 population, uh -huh. which gives a little bit of a room to grow, as it were. <laughs> right. Um, so technically, in that sense, San Antonio was a city in the late 19th, 18th century when it did meet, reach about that population. Okay. Does, I don't know if that helps or not. But, but it, it does. Yeah. But I, I guess the, the, the part that I found fascinating that really kind of set the tone for what, what continued for um, well over a century, uh, which was basically... Uh, what went into making San Antonio a low tax, low wage place. And that, that started very early um, and, and partly because of, if I understand correctly, the, the Spanish, um, the way, the way the Spain had set up the city. I don't think the Spanish influence was particularly important there. I think that the, the issue of low taxes um, was was something that became prevalent when the uh, when Texas was open to American migration, and what we get is a lot of white Southerners moving in initially on the East Coast, of course, uh, and some of them trickling over here. People like more uh, like uh, Sam Maverick, but the Southern culture of the time. This is pre-Civil War, of course. Uh, Southerners believed in very little government. They believed the government shouldn't be involved in anybody's life in any significant way and taxes should be low. You take that idea and you combine it with the German population coming in in the beginning in the 40s and the Germans are coming in largely at a time when Germany 
as we know, it didn't exist, but the German ideas about, about the way politics worked uh, for these people who came over anyway, was called 19th century liberalism. And that was a belief that government should be very limited, taxes should be low, and the government had no business interfering in your daily life. All of that came from the experience of Germans living under German monarchs in what we call Germany today. So it was a reaction against the, prom the predominant form of political organization in Germany at the time. So you get two groups coming together who independently have come to this idea that government should be so minimalistic and taxes should be so low. I, I guess what I was thinking it was actually just a, a, a little boost because of the Spanish history that helped them uh, think that that was okay because uh, from reading your book, I, I never knew this, that the uh, city actually owned a lot of land and found that they could sell that land uh, and use it for purposes that anywhere else they would have to pass some bond issues or otherwise come up with money. Yeah, and, and that, was, that was an important thing for the earliest American boosters. There were, of course, people in San Antonio prior to 1836 who were trying to develop the city. Uh, they weren't having a lot of luck because they were living in a monarchical structure where the viceroy in Mexico City was basically in charge of whatever was going to happen to any place in the Spanish Empire. So it was highly centralized. And opportunities for individual initiative were extremely limited in that situation. Mm. So, this, yes, the city had control over a very significant amount of land. And when the American boosters show up and they begin to understand that, they do, in fact, begin to think of that using that land as a booster tool. And it's kind of one way to do that is you sell the land to new settlers and of course, after the, the uh, revolution for Texas independence, you know, the, the Texas legislature makes very generous terms for granting land grants. And so they are using that political lever to try and grow the city. And then when they get people coming in, in theory for them, they're gonna use that land also to raise money for public improvements. Let's uh, talk briefly about, you, you talk about the boosters using the money. What would they wanna use it for? Well, it's traditional booster things. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that is constant throughout the book uh, is the issue of the attractive city. And this is a concept that is very long lived in urban history in America. Uh, and it is still, if you probably have noticed, people still talk about how, make, how to make a city attractive. The most recent version of this is something called the creative city. Uh -huh. which is another definition of attractive. The problem is, what is attractive? For a booster in the 19th century, it was making the city look modern by their standards. And modern meant that you had to have things like streets, and then you had to have paved streets later. You had to have modern, in quotes, architecture. So you take the original... Uh, San Fernando Cathedral architecture is very simple and colonial, and you create a French Gothic facade on it, and you put it on top of it. Mm -hmm. That is modern for the 1870s. Of course, modern changes its definition over time, so you are always pursuing what is most modern looking if you're a booster, which is what people in San Antonio tried to do to a pretty good extent, great extent. Uh, another manifestation of this is the what we call skyscrapers. Uh -huh. it, a city has to be a place where there are skyscrapers or it's not a city. That's an idea that comes around around World War I and becomes kind of the rage until the Great Depression, which kind of puts a crimp in building very tall buildings because they're also very expensive. Uh -huh. uh, we, we saw a huge yeah. amount of that happening in the uh, mid to late 20s. Yeah, there was a lot. Quite a few. Um, but the boosters here, um, well, there, there was another factor that I want to go through fairly quickly, and then we'll get on to some of the people. Uh, and, th and that was uh, fascinating how you talk about the role of the military. Uh, and, and San Antonio was, from the beginning, partly a military 
city. I mean, when they started the missions, it was also with the Presidio, for the soldiers. And of course, uh, throughout our history, because we were a frontier sister, city um, and because of the war with Mexico, we, we had a considerable military force here. And it, you basically talk about how they offer both uh, an economic floor, but also help create an economic ceiling. Talk about that. Yeah, it's interesting that actually the role of the military in San Antonio starts in 1718, because the way the Spanish planner set it up, the military would be the only group in town that had money, that is their, their monthly paychecks, if you will. Uh, and so the military's pay system was going to be the base for the economy to grow. What would happen is settlers would grow products for the garrison, food, and the garrison would buy it from them, hence the exchange. So from the beginning, the military was a key part of the local economy. In the beginning of the period of the American uh, development of the city, uh, they accidentally get into that. There is a break between 1836 and 1845 where there is no money coming in from the military. That's about the only time that ever happened. Afterwards, we get the Mexican War, of course, and then we get the garrisons being built and the, the, um, the depot is established in the 1850s to supply all the frontier forts. So that's when the military becomes really important in both shaping and restricting the city economically. The problem is that if you're a, um, a merchant in this city, the best thing you can have is a military contract to buy food and whatever for the military and ship it to various forts or to carry, to carry the goods from the importation that's going on from uh, back east. So what you get is a lot of people committed to army contracts, which is good for the city in the sense that it helps attract settlers. The Germans become very important in the 1850s in San Antonio because they come in and help do that military industrial complex of the 1850s. At the same time though, the problem is people get very comfortable with the fact that the military contracts are always there from year to year. So there's a very, very important source of income which could be used for development, but that's another issue about how you use your money. And the problem is that if you have most of the merchants committed to the military contract system, and it's always going to be there, and it's very lucrative, there is no initiative to go out and explore other ways to grow the city. Yeah. And that basically becomes the base, no pun intended, the basic issue that makes the military both a great gift, but also a great problem all the way through the 1960s. Right, and when I, I remember uh, Jan Jarbo was a columnist and her writing a column, uh, her point was that uh, when we had uh, Kelly Air Force Base and a huge uh, civil service component out there, that uh, just the civil service culture is not exactly entrepreneurial. No, it's not. <clears throat> it was very important to the city in quite a different way because when the base began to expand during World War II and hired so many people, it ended up hiring a lot of minorities. And so mm -hmm. Kelly is just an example, but all the bases are the same way. The civil service component of every base becomes a very secure source of employment for minorities in San Antonio, which helps to create, for the first time in the city's history, a stable middle class that's based in the west side, somewhat less to the east side, but it's basically why the middle class Mexican American community begins to emerge. That's very important for the city and it's for po its politics, but it does not help economically because as you say, you know, it, it's stable, it's secure, and most people are not engaged in business after all. They're engaged in being employed by the federal government. So the, the, the business community is still not picking up on the idea that they ought to be trying to, get, to grow the city. I, it, that, that was a huge lift. It's, you know, it was credited the Kelly Air Force Base uh, with creating the Mexican-American middle class. Uh, prior to that time, there, there was uh, uh, just an amazing level of poverty 
back when uh, one of the largest jobs they had was shelling pecans. And, and yes. I, do I recall correctly that uh, some were paid a dollar seventy-five, not an hour, a dollar seventy-five a week? It worked out to about that. Yeah, um, I think the going rate was something like fifty cents per hundred pounds of shelled pecans. Mm-hmm. So what you had was whole family shelling because a hundred pounds is sure. quite a bit to get, and it would work out to you know a couple bucks a week. Well, this makes kind of a transition uh, because one of the stories about one of the first characters I think we should focus on is Sam Maverick. Uh, Sam was here. Uh, well, he wasn't here at the Alamo. He was here before the Alamo. He was the one who had the good fortune of being sent from the Alamo to. Uh, attend the uh, session that pr- produced the uh, Texas Declaration of Independence. So yes. he was gone when Santa Ana arrived. He came back and became uh, an important business leader. Uh, he was mayor for a, a while. Uh, and of course, he was from a prominent uh, South Carolina family. His, his father actually had been in uh, correspondence with Thomas Jefferson on, on horticultural matters. And uh, had had big a big plantation or more than one. I think he offered his son one, but the uh, Sam had wanderlust. Uh, so tell us about his involvement as especially as a I think more important as a business leader than what he did or didn't accomplish as mayor. Well, as a business person, he had uh, an essential booster characteristic, which was he was he understood the relationship between real estate and an urban development. That is what you have to do is assemble parcels of land to sell to people, not only to bring in the population, but to create an econo- beginnings of an e- economy. And he was, he became very famous for his fanatical interest in land. I once looked at his, uh, his personal diaries, which are in the archives at UT Austin. And they basically consisted of him walking around San Antonio, no, noticing what properties were, were for sale and noting them in his notebook. And even so, even when he takes a walk, he's looking for property to buy. Hmm. Uh, and he assembles enormous amounts of land, of course, all the way, you know, through West Texas and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and everybody thinks of him as, you know, the rancher, the, the guy who, gave us the word maverick to the English language. The fascinating thing about him was he was a very determined city builder. He wanted to increase the value of his land by bringing people in, not just selling the land, but encouraging them to help found businesses and things like that so that the city would begin to grow very dynamically. And he assembled the first, what I call a booster coalition in 1849, which didn't succeed but it shows you the kind of thing that boosters are interested in. He had a very comprehensive program that covered things. How do you make an attractive city? He had, he had an explanation for that. How do you grow economies? He had an explanation for that. It didn't work, but you, you, know, you have to give him enormous credit for trying. He did try. But I, I found particularly interesting the coalition he put together to early on try and bring a railroad to San Antonio because everybody knew that you know, railroads would, would really, uh, if you had one thing to help the city grow, uh, being on the railroad line would, would be it. Uh, so he put together a group uh, and tell us about both what happened and the lesson that was learned. Well, he and a group of other investors got a charter to, to build a railroad in now, this was in the time period in American history where railroads were just beginning to get built in, in any extensive way into networks. And the idea of connecting your city to what's called its hinterland, it is the area that the city is, has as a market for city products and things. The railroad is essential to that. So the problem for Maverick was trying to build a railroad when there wasn't either any a population to sustain the railroad, nor an economy to sustain it. Uh, and he was hoping that the railroad would be the, the jump starter for all of that, which was not a silly idea because there are other places who, which did the same thing. I could mention Chicago. 
built a railroad to the largest city in Illinois at the time, which was Galena, which was a mining town. The idea was to tap the wealth of the lead miners and bring it into Chicago and ship it out to Lake Michigan. So, and that worked. So this is not a silly idea. The -hmm. problem is that his coalition made a number of mistakes. They went into the idea with with the problem they had to raise money, a lot of money. And to do that, they needed some help. So what did they do? They turned to the county government and the city government but the idea of selling, of providing money to buy bonds that would you know, pay for the railroad. So this idea, well, it was what everybody else in the 19th century was doing to build railroads, had the problem that once they started building, they didn't have the right kind of technical skills mm-hmm. to build a railroad. And they had a lot of people who wouldn't fulfill their obligations That is, they would say, I'll buy $1,000 worth of the bonds, but they wouldn't. And then the other problem was the army. The people who had the big bucks from the beginning were the people who were shipping the army's cargoes around around the state. They didn't invest. So right away you have the business community with the biggest pool of money refusing to invest in the railroad. And, and what was the technology of their transportation system? <laughs> the ox cart. The ox cart, yes. Yeah. Well, when it got fancy, they would put some horses in and pull, but mostly it was oxen who were pulling these things. A um, little bit slow, uh, very expensive, but that was the point. You could charge very large sums of money to transport these goods over long distances. And they really recognized the railroad as a major competitor which maintained the problem of getting a railroad all the way through the 1870s. People who had invested in serving the military did not want a railroad for San Antonio. So that was one piece. The other piece of it was politically, when the city and the county voted to raise taxes to buy, to provide the money to go onto the market in New York to sell bonds and things like that, the city had to, you know, they were raising taxes and right away people are saying, well, what are we doing this for? There's some initial enthusiasm for the railroad, but it quickly peters out because the railroad is not being built. And so what happens is this anti-tax idea begins to formulate as a big issue in San Antonio. Eventually what you get is a taxpayer's revolt against the railroad bonds and they against the taxes that are being raised to pay for the railroad bonds. And it's the Southern German coalition, if you will, that comes uh-huh. together and makes that a, basically a permanent feature of San Antonio politics. So the, the, was there also uh, the perception that some of the members of the booster coalition, having won this bond money, uh, were uh, planning to use it to way to help their business? Well, it's a little murky, but what happens is basically is we have, we would call it politely mismanagement of funds. Mm-hmm. The money they did raise was not enough to build a railroad, but on the other hand, it kept being bled off on, on other kinds of issues that were coming up as they tried to maintain their momentum. And the records on this are not very clear, but basically a lot of the money just seems to have disappeared, which led to... Uh, speculation that these people were just ripping off the public, which <laughs> did not help the boosters in their cause when they were trying to build a railroad uh, in the 1850s. Well, I found fascinating too uh, that you had early records that indicated that when the city did sell land uh, in order to raise money, uh, some key people seem to have bought it most up, uh, uh, bought most of it up at, at amazing prices. Yes. And, and amazing uh, terms. Yeah. Look, well, this was a huge, the biggest mistake the boosters made. And it's a little technical, but basically the system for buying and selling public land, if you bought a piece of public land, you paid one third down and then you paid the other two thirds within one year. Mm-hmm. The boosters changed that to say that you paid 10% down and then you had something like 50 years to pay the remaining 90%. And this land was being sold very cheaply 
at public auction. And the people who had the inside track, if you will, uh, bought most of the land. And this was quickly noticed in the, uh, among the public. Uh, there were really serious accusations about corruption uh, over land sales. It was a real mess because the people who were in political power were also the people buying the land. And they, they were the people who had changed the terms of the agreement for selling land to this, from this, or buying land from the city so that they benefited enormously from this. And it's so transparently, obviously the wrong way to go that the booster coalition just basically lost all public confidence in what they were doing. And so that, that uh, set us back and as you, you say, uh, set a, a template for the yes. city. Yes, uh, all, all the way through the rest of the 19th century. Uh, we did have on occasion some mayors who tried to uh, get some streets widened and paved and uh, clean things up. Uh, but the first time we saw some really serious uh, kind of a, a boom, would it be accurate to say that that was in the 20s? Um, well, there is a boom when the railroad finally does arrive in 1877. That's right, yeah. Uh, and there is land boom. Uh, there is a significant increase in population, uh, which continues through the 1890s. Uh, and so the railroad is the critical thing to get this the city back on the track of growing pretty rapidly. Uh, the 1920s are different. It's when the city starts to slow down in its growth pattern its population growth is not keeping up with Houston and, and Dallas. And by 1930, the city has lost its place as the biggest city in Texas, right. which is a, you know, the, the crown of, of any urban competition is that you're the biggest city in the state in this case. And San Antonio was that in 1920 and 1930, it was not. The, by the way, going back just a bit, I thought it was kind of interesting that when they did get a railroad, it was partly because of the military. It was because the military, this is where the, the crunch came. The military wanted the railroad because it would dramatically reduce their transportation costs. The and, people and in San Antonio. Pardon? Yeah. And improve its efficiency. And improve, there's all kinds of things. The benefit is an enormous benefit. No city in the 19th century could survive without a railroad. Mm -hmm. And San Antonio almost did not get a railroad because of the opposition to the idea, which was led by the army contractors who did not want the competition of a railroad. They were absolutely right, by the way. It drove them all out of business. Mm -hmm. But they had the political power at the time to almost cause the city to die because they were not going to get that railroad. Do I recall that it was General Sheridan that uh, basically gave them an ultimatum? Yes, he gave them an ultimatum, and they, it was basically ignored by most of the business community. They didn't believe him. And there was, there was a complex series of steps where the city did try to respond to the, the Army's demand for a railroad, and the back and forth between them took several years before they actually got it all worked out. Um, in that process, one of the things the city tried to do to mollify the Army was to give them what became Fort Sam Houston, the land from Fort Sam Houston. The army liked that, but they still wanted the railroad. Well, they, they were uh, the depot for an, a whole string of forts all the way out to El Paso, maybe was it even beyond there, uh, of forts that were used to protect the westward bound settlers from the, from the Indians. Yeah, yeah uh, and that worked very well. The problem yeah, it, go ahead. Oh, so that was, that was an awful lot of, uh, we're talking about a very big operation. Um, and if I understand correctly, General Sheridan finally said, you know, if you don't get us a railroad, we're going to, what was it, Fort Worth or Dallas? And setting up a depot there. Yeah, they were going, he, he wanted to move the depot to, to uh, Fort Worth. That was his big threat. And he didn't do it, obviously, in the end, but it caused a lot of consternation locally I, but I will say that, that many of the business people simply believed the Army would not leave for the simple reason they always had been here. So therefore, they couldn't possibly want to leave. Well, we later found out in 1995 that was 
Uh, yes. <laughs> not, enough, not enough of a force, but we, we, may, we may be able to touch on, on that later. So we have a, this um, lack of boosters. Meanwhile, uh, the city is growing like crazy. Uh, most decades, I, I think there was a, a series of decades in which the average growth was like 50%. Uh, yeah, what, it was what, quite vigorous. What was, uh, what was making that happen? Well, a lot of that has to do with what are what external issues that is external to San Antonio, external to Texas. You have to look at the national economy and how it was developing at the time and where people were looking for new opportunities. So you have, I mean, the most famous example of this is the California gold rush when people just left and drove some from the East Coast to go seek their fortune in the gold fields. Mm -hmm. a, a less spectacular form of that would be people looking for jobs. Uh, as the late 19th century uh, economy develops, you have massive immigration in the United States. The question is, where are those immigrants going to go? And then, of course, where are native-born Americans going to go seeking opportunity? And Texas is only on the radar screen for those people beginning in the late 1890s. So there's a gap there before we get a, a really big push of population. In the meantime, there is within Texas, there is movement of the population around the state. So in the 1880s and 1890s, for example, a lot of people in East Texas move into San Antonio. Uh, this is probably due to the fact that with the coming of the railroad, there are more job opportunities, there are more businesses being founded, there are more jobs here. Mm -hmm. By the way, jobs is a form of attraction. An attractive city is a place where you can get work at good wages. And right. so there are people coming for that. Uh, and there were, but there were also another stream of immigrants coming up from Mexico who were getting work but not good wages. Yeah, the Mexican connection is, I think, in, in the longer run, it's very important to San Antonio, but there are periods where our, our trade relations with Mexico are kind of peculiar. Um, there is a big uh, boon to the Mexican trade in the Civil War, of course, because San Antonio is a major place in the, uh, on, on the route for the cotton smuggling that goes into Tex from Texas into Mexico and from Mexico to England to the cotton mills there. So there are people in San Antonio who make a lot of money, basically as cotton smugglers. Mm -hmm. um, after that, the, the Mexican influence is not nearly as important for a long time. Um, it's because, again, the business community is not that attuned to international trade ideas. How do you develop an international trade business? It's not something that these people are really interested in. So you have the population growth that's coming in, in terms of percentage growth is important, but if you look at it in terms of total population, San Antonio is a relatively small city for the, the most, of, well, for the late 19th century, and it begins to pass the, the markers, the census markers of being a bigger city in the period around World War I. And a lot of that, of course, is due to the Mexican Revolution, when you get a lot of uh, refugees coming in from the the conflict down there. And that was both uh, both very the the campesinos, the really the really poor people, but also it was a fair number of uh, well educated people who, uh, during the revolution, at one time or the other, if you were politically active, that you were on the wrong side, and it, that could be dangerous. So oh, yes. Got, got Incredibly of, dangerous. <laughs> yeah. so we had a lot of refugees, both of, of uh, very poor people. Also, during some of the, the – the, a lot of people were uh, pushed off the land, a lot of poor people. And ended up yes, and up. they come into San Antonio. San Antonio becomes a very large, cheap labor market around World War I. Uh, and that's due to the other phenomenon called the Winter Garden. It's when the cattle ranching business in, in Texas begins to go on uh, through fundamental changes. Ranchers in, in South Texas sell their land. It's converted to the winter garden. And the people coming into the winter garden to work that opportunity are basically from the upper Midwest. 
Mm-hmm. They're from Minnesota. They're from Wisconsin. Some of them from Illinois and Iowa. They're coming in as farmers uh, who need labor. And it's labor intensive kind of work. And so these, it's this match not made in heaven, but it's, it's a match. All these refugees are coming in. <clears throat> they go to El Paso. They go to San Antonio. And we begin to be a labor market where the farmers come to San Antonio to hire workers on a seasonal basis. And so we begin to get the migrant worker issue. And we had just not only huge barrios, but incredible poverty. I mentioned the wages, uh, but infant death was uh, at third world levels. uh, Yes. uh, Often from diarrhea. Um, It was, it became a national scandal. Uh, through the years, every, periodically, uh, some national magazine or eventually TV station would come down and, and do a story on poverty on the west side of San Antonio. Um, yeah, we became a uh, poster child for poverty. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know, magazine uh, did that. There, there was one mayor, uh, and he's li- kind of larger than life, even though he was only mayor for one term. That was Mari Maverick Sr., was he the grandson of, of Sam Maverick or the great grandson? I think he's great grandson. <laughs> great grandson, yeah. Um, and, and he was quite a character, and I don't want to spend much time on him because the time is flying too fast here. Yes. <laughs> but, but he was quite a character. He had been a two term congressman, and he reminded me I was uh, re- rereading uh, part of his biography, and he was kind of like AOC. I mean, he was this liberal coming out of the South one of only a very few liberals to vote for a bill against lynching. Uh, and uh, very soon uh, the press was talking about the Mavericks uh, and they gave him credit for basically organizing a caucus of, of liberals. It's not clear that he really did, but it was you know his great grandfather having established that name uh, as what we know as a Maverick, it was an easy thing for the press to pick up on. But he did make quite a national splash and he, he authored a bestseller. Uh, there's uh, a magazine had a picture of him having lunch uh, with a, a certain author of, of Mice and Men, John Steinbeck, because <laughs> the same publisher was publishing them both. So he, it was, he had become a celebrity. But he did, to his credit, really try and um, uh, make things better for the, for the, for the Mexican, Mexican-American workers. Uh, I mean, one Sherwood Anderson wrote that he had um, he had actually paid for the Mexican vote, but he did it legally, and that is that he had helped get them uh, a certain amount of raises, uh, as opposed to just uh, giving them you know a, a quarter and paying for their uh, their poll tax. Uh, but how how did he do as a reformer? Because that's what he was running on. He was running as a reformer, but he was opposed to what the reformers wanted, which was city manager government. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was an interesting irony. Um, in fact, he acted pretty much like an old-fashioned political boss. He, when he got into the mayor's office, he fired everybody on the public payroll and hired his own people and then issued a public statement saying he was not trying to create a political machine. He was just hiring people who had supported him, which is <laughs> the logic. Um, <laughs> As a mayor, he did change the form of city government. He tried to make it much more efficient. Uh, And he had a vision for the city, which was based on his career as a congressman. He he understood what we today call the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And he tried to sell local businessmen on the idea that we should start participating in that development as World War II was beginning. He tried very hard to get that done. They just wouldn't listen to him. So what could have been his greatest legacy? He could have been the man who changed the direction of economic development in San Antonio. Well, he was very interested in, in the new, just beginning of the Air Force, right? And didn't, yeah. didn't he want to, want to bring manufacturing here uh, and not just rely on servicing the military? Exactly. Can I interrupt and, with the, yeah, with the few questions? We have a few questions from the, sure. the audience and they, they, they actually are, uh, well, they, they were pertaining to what you were talking about a few minutes ago. But let me ask, uh, let me get just throw the three of them out and then you can answer, put them in within your conversation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Does that, does that work? Okay. Uh, the first one is um, about uh, lynching and what was um, the plaque at City Hall 
mentions a, a lynching tree nearby. What was, uh, what's, the, what's the history around lynching in San Antonio? And, uh, do you want me to, I'll answer that now if you'd like. Okay. Uh, this refers, I believe, to the 19th century. Uh, it, is, it has not anything to do, as far as I know, with racial issues. What's going on is um, there are a variety of criminals in San Antonio uh, who uh, are plaguing the community with various kinds of crimes. One of them is uh, stealing horses. And in the 19th century, stealing someone's horse is not a good thing to do. So uh, there were a couple occasions where they, they uh, captured horse thieves and there was, uh, shall we say, public pressure to hang them high. And there was a tree next to the, what was called a bat cave. That was the city hall that was built in the 1850s and degenerated into a bat cave. But there was, uh, there were a couple of hangings there. And then the other hangings I know about occurred as the Civil War began. And there was a lot of opposition to secession in San Antonio, particularly among Germans. And a Southern Vigilante Association was organized which among other things, did what vigilantes do. One morning it turned out that there were a lot of people hanging from trees around San Antonio. And that kind of quieted down opposition to secession. So that's the, the history, of, as far as I know, there might have been other incidents, but that's the lynching issue in San Antonio. How, David, I would mention, I just happened to have been to, not long ago, to the lynching uh, memorial uh, in uh, in Jackson, and uh, they have they've done a lot of research on lynching throughout the country, and they have a very impressive uh, monument of uh, in which they are all memorialized on these great steel um, hanging platforms. And there was one in Bear County, and only one, and it did involve a black man who was accused of being improper with a a white girl. Yeah, the classic. So that was the only yeah. one that, I, that they know of. Do you know the date of that one? I, I can't recall. Okay. Yeah. It, I, think it, it was in, I think it was in the early 20th century, though. Yeah, I didn't find accounts about lynching as much as I found vigilante activities. There was a, in a, um, I can't remember the technical term. There was a branch of the KKK here in the 1860s after the war. And I read accounts of where they would go night riding and they mostly operated in Bear County, that is not in the city itself. And I read one account where they supposedly inter they intercepted a group of black men uh, and took them out somewhere in the county and none of them ever came back alive. Mm. Um, tracing that down became impossible because obviously at the time this was regarded as perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is there was a KKK operation here, and I do not know an awful lot about its operations, what it did. There was also one in the 20s, which is even bigger. Margie, what's your next question? Okay, the next question is about um, going back to the railroads. Uh, so the railroad lines entered San Antonio on the west side. How did this affect the Mexican-American neighborhood of, of Laredito? Oh, interesting question. Um, Short answer is I'm not sure what happened to the neighborhood. Uh, the first railroad came in from the east and its depot was uh, on the north, it was northeast of the Alamo. That was the uh, Galveston, Harriston, Harristown and uh, San Antonio Railroad it came in in 1877. I think what the questioner is referring to is called the International and Great Northern Railroad which arrived some years later and came in on the west side. And this depot is still there. Uh, you can, if you walk to, if you go to the UTSA's downtown campus and walk a couple blocks north, there's this wonderful old building, which is a railroad station. That was the IGN's depot. I think it's a city office building of some sort now. Um, the impact of the railroad was really profound on the west side in general, because one of the things they did was they put in cattle pens and for shipping cattle out. And that created a certain noisomeness to the neighborhood. 
and you don't like to be around 19th century trains anyway. They didn't have a lot of safety features. There were no crossing guards. Um, if you didn't look the right way when you were crossing a railroad track, you might get mowed over. Um, there were a lot of casualties from that kind of accident, not just in San Antonio, but in a lot of them around the country. And railroads were loud, noisy. They required coal for fuel. So they, there was all kinds of unattractive things about railroad uh, yards, their marshalling yards. That on the west side really killed uh, development for, shall we say, middle-class housing south of Commerce Street, south of West Commerce Street, and except for Prospect Hill, which was, the, which was founded in the 1870s and was a middle-class neighborhood and then later became a middle-class Mexican-American neighborhood. That's the exception. But if you look south of Prospect Hill, what you get is this growing really, really bad slum. And it's the, it's the um, in immigration history, there's this thing about entry points in the cities. Where do people who are not natives come into the city? They came in on the west side, a lot of them. So it turns out that interestingly, it wasn't just Mexican Americans come, well, Mexicans coming in, Italians came in to that area too. Uh, there was a, an Italian colony there and that's where some other, uh, some Asians came in. So it was a catchment area for immigrants. Uh, it was also the West Side Vice District. Um, and there's nothing like a nice row of brothels in your neighborhood to kill property values. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it was a bad place in a lot of ways. And, and the railroad started that degeneration of the, ra of the neighborhood. And it is, by the way, on the East Side, where you still have the depot, that became the black area town because again, undesirable real estate, where there are minorities going to live? Well, they end up being basically transported into the east side. Uh, it took a long time. Uh, in fact, the 1950 master plan for, Chicago, for San Antonio recommended that all the pockets of African Americans around San Antonio should be consolidated on the east side. 1950. Sorry? 1950. Yeah, the 1950 master plan for the city of San Antonio. Right. It's in their black and white print. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> That's a, we have that coming out in a book next year with Char. He talks okay. about it. Uh, Oh, okay. Um, okay. We'll take. He, he can take care of it then. <laughs> the next question uh, goes back to um, the military-industrial complex creating jobs that led to a Mexican middle class. Um, so this question is: Would you say that San Antonio has grown up with a strong Mexican middle class? It got a very strong Mexican middle class, and it became very powerful, as we all know, because the communities organized for public service, <clears throat> which was founded in the parishes and relied upon a lot of Kelly workers as the people who would organize the local chapters of cops. So it, it Kelly was, has profound effect on, on the Mexican American community. And among other things, eventually, besides making them middle class, it is the basis for their political power. David, so, I, I would, I would add to that, that was actually, they had uh, the, the wives of, of Kelly workers. Their first president was a male. Everyone since was uh, all the leadership since have been have been women. Um, yeah. And uh, actually, they've gone through a real problem because that was back in the day where uh, a worker at Kelly made enough money to support a family, and and the wives didn't work. Nowadays, of course, a much higher percentage of wives work. And that's been an issue that COPS has, has COPS and Metro have had to, to deal with. Yeah, I think that the environment in San Antonio has changed quite a bit for, uh, and so that the heyday of COPS in, in at least the work I did is in the 1970s, 1980s and afterwards. I mean, they were, they were, they were very important, still important. One of the other issues is suburbanization because when the Economic Development Foundation began attracting all of those call centers that were set up out near what was would be the uh, the research park. All those large call centers lead to lots of employees, and lots of people on the west side moved into the, those areas. The, again, middle class kind of jobs, uh, not all that well paying, but on the other hand, 
it was their opportunity to move into the suburbs and they took it. So the issue were for cops is that they had always been the west side, the traditional west side, with the boundary being Loop 410. Now, many people live beyond Loop 410, and it creates an issue about cops that always been against the urbanization, and now many of the people who are potentially supporters of, or perhaps even members of cops, live out in the suburbs, which creates problems about the kind of policies they can pursue, I think. Uh, David, and since, maybe since you've gone, they've been working on that. Well, for example, one of their member churches is Our Lady of Guadalupe out in Holotus. Yes. Um, also, I would just mention that on the ballot that we're voting on right now is a measure uh, to use money that had been used for buying uh, development rights to land over the recharge zone and using it instead for job training. COPS was a major factor in getting the mayor to do that. And their, organ- their, their program, Project Quest, has provided the model for what uh, kind of high quality level of job training. Uh, yeah, it has. It's, it's, I think it's one of the most important things that cops did. And it's part of a, a trend in San Antonio where you now have a lot of academies that are built, that are dedicated to a particular kind of industry and training workers that kind of almost as, as needed kind of situation, but they're getting good training and they're getting good jobs. The other thing I would like to mention since I have an affiliation, uh, is that UTSA has become a major producer of pretty high skilled people. Uh, And I frankly think that the community hasn't quite recognized just how important UTSA has been in that particular area of training people to be eligible for and capable of performing very well in good paying jobs. That's my plug. We're we're almost out of town, but I just want to make a a point that is fascinating because the, the role of the military is so important in your book. And what we, we haven't gotten to, I'd hope we would, is the transition beginning in the 70s. Cops was part of it. Henry Cisneros, a big part of it. General McDermott, a big part of it. But also in 95, when the uh, Base Realignment uh, Commission, the BRAC, shut down Kelly, uh, people were just pulling their hair out. They thought, there goes our economy. But part of BRAC, too, was consolidating basically the vast majority of the nation's military medical treatment centers and training in San Antonio. And meanwhile, uh, the Air Force has a major cyber warfare installation here, and the National Security Agency has its second largest installation here, very quietly out on the west side, all these thousands of cyber warfare people. UTSA has become one of the nation's leading colleges now, gotten a number of multi-million dollar grants to train cyber warriors. So but the point is that the military, because of BRAC, has gone to a position from where it was kind of a damper on the economy to now where it's part of the knowledge industry boost of the economy. Yeah, it's a critical shift and it's incredibly important, not just for San Antonio, but for a lot of people outside. And this is, you know, you're right. The military, the problem was the military was not technology oriented in the way we are today. And the mass of people who came to Kelly and other, uh, as servicemen were not being paid very big salaries because they were basically unskilled labor, if you will. What's happened since BRAC is that the nature of the military had changed profoundly. Uh, up till the, so the Vietnam War, the military was a damper on the economy because of the things I've said. But after that, it be, the, because of the Vietnam War, we, we developed the concept of a professional army versus a draft army. And with a professional army, you get highly skilled people doing very, very advanced kinds of work. And when BRAC comes in, this is where our opportunity comes. The military has changed. So we have like the health industry in San Antonio got a tremendous boost when they, when San Antonio was named as the national headquarters for for health research and, and treatment out at Fort Sam Houston. Fort Sam Houston is unrecognizable today from what it used to be because of that. And the cybersecurity stuff is sort of snuck in very appropriately. Um, it came into town on a quiet, but there's thousands of jobs involved in that. And, and, and spinoff companies that are... Um, yeah, and I don't get back on it. Yeah, I mean, there's 
tremendous energy in San Antonio's economy today compared to what it was prior to, the, say, 1970. Well, I, I wish we had time. We're already over time. It's gone entirely too fast. Um, but a, a wonderful part of the book is from 1950 on, where you cover a period of 50s uh, to the mid-70s, where uh, the, the, uh, the no government expenditures was kind of enforced by the Good Government League. And I really recommend people reading that. And then, of course, what happened in the mid-70s with Henry Cisneros, General McDermott, COPS, um, the growth of the medical center, UTSA, all these things contributing to a, a huge transition to the city we are now. Uh, also the education, uh, the last city council, I haven't checked on this one, uh, all of the minority members, uh, that is people of color who are on city council had advanced degrees. I think all or most of them do today. Uh, it, it just is uh, in a, an amazing uh, transition. Uh, and the, the story is told very quickly. One quick story is the pivotal election was Henry Cisneros versus John Steen, Henry's first run for mayor. He came back from training uh, on the East Coast, including at Harvard, uh, on urban affairs and urban politics. And he wanted to become mayor in order to do the booster kind of thing that you're talking about, the, the leadership. Yep. And um, the, the, the fellow who was up late reading your book, night before last or whenever it was, told me that he was raising money for Henry. And he went to Sam Bar shop for that first race. And uh, Sam was a major Northside developer. And he asked him if he could give some money to Henry. And Sam said, well, how much do you have in mind? And he said, well, with a kind of a gulp, you know, how about $500? <laughs> and Bar shop, Bar shop so, uh, wrote him a check and he looked at it, it was $5,000. And uh, he said, well, this is great, but uh, I'm wondering why, why so much. And Sam said, son, this election is going to determine whether this city is run by the San Antonio Country Club or the Oak Hills Country Club. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer became clear. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the, 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 the importance of Oak Hills Country Club was that was built for the new north side uh, business elite who were the, the, the boosters, the people who are really trying to grow the city. Yeah, to some extent. It, it would be, and for the doctors. Uh, and for the doctors. Right. And for the golf, whatever. <laughs> right. Uh, so it's fascinating uh, because, you know, if you'd already read the book, if you didn't get that joke immediately, you would. Uh, if, you, uh, if you had uh, read it, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. I recommend it. Uh, so, uh, uh, David, thank you so much for thank you. sharing this with us. I have an announcement to make about the next um, session because uh, our time is more than up. <laughs> so, and thank you, thank you to the readers for joining us for the Maverick Book Club. It's a monthly series from Trinity University Press discussing books that are shaping the narrative landscape of Texas and especially San Antonio. The next session will be November 11th at 7 p.m. featuring a conversation with local artist and legend, beekeeper and kite builder, Pat Hammond, and her son, Robert Hammond, co-founder and director of the Friends of the High Line in New York City. He and a, a friend of his are totally responsible for getting that landmark development uh, built in New York City. The book is Name Them, They Fly Better, Pat Hammond's Theory of Aerodynamics. Unlike our other Maverick Book Club events, you will not need to register. Instead, it will be premiering live on the Trinity University YouTube, Trinity University Press YouTube channel. And you can purchase the book on tupress.org at a 20% off discount if you use the promo code, all caps, MAVERICK, and the numbers 11. That's MAVERICK11. Once again, thank you, David, and thank you, readers, and good night.